The first is some, some stuff about, about heterosexual marriage done by a University of Washington psychologist named John Gottman. Now Gottman already is interesting to a sociologist like me because when you, if you look at the sociological research on the family or on, on marriage, we only have two, two types of, of marriage, intact and divorce. Right? And as you know, there are a lot of different intact or divorced families. So, excuse me. So Gottman says, let me study successful marriage. What makes a successful marriage successful? You know the kind I'm talking about, the kind where the people have been married for 58 years and they go out to a restaurant and they still look lovingly at each other across the table, or they walk in the park and they still hold hands, and you think to yourself, as any normal person would, how did they do it? <laughs> what makes a successful marriage succeed? And here's what Gottman finds. He says basically that we have two models of, of marriage in our, in our head. One he calls the friendship partnership model, and the other he calls the passion and romance model. Guess which one succeeds? Friendship and partnership. Okay, think of the politics of passion and romance versus the politics of friendship and partnership. Politics of passion and romance is the politics of inequality, of powerlessness. Oh my God, I'm so out of control. I don't know whether I should call. What's gonna happen? I'm, I, I'm completely powerless here. Politics of friendship and partnership much more egalitarian. The more egalitarian the marriage, the more likely it is to succeed. But now I'm gonna look at some sociological research about what that actually looks like. It turns out that the best measure of egalitarian marriages, there are two of them, across all cultures, pre-industrial, post-industrial, advanced, not advanced, developing, there are two measures that predict how egalitarian a marriage is. One, does the woman work outside of the, fam of the home for money, right? That's obviously a pre-industrial measure. Remember in your hands, I assume that will be the case for most of you. The second is, how much housework and childcare does the husband do? That turns out to be the most important variable that predicts an egalitarian marriage in the United States. So, here's what the data suggests. One, when men share housework and childcare, their kids do better in school. The more housework and childcare a man does, the more friends his child has. The kid is, has lower rates of absenteeism, higher rates of achievement, is less likely to go to a child therapist, is less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, is less likely to be put on prescription medication. When men share housework and childcare, their kids are happier, healthier, and do better in school. All right, maybe that's not enough of a motivation for men. When men share housework and childcare, their wives are happier. Well, duh. But not only that, their wives are healthier. Their wives are less likely to go to therapists, be diagnosed with depression, take prescription medication. They're more likely to stay in shape. They have more time. So when men share, and they report much higher levels of marital satisfaction. So, when men share housework and childcare, their wives are happier and healthier. All right, maybe that's not enough of a motivation for men. When men share housework and childcare, the men are healthier. They smoke less, they drink less, they take recreational drugs less often, they are far less likely to go to, the th to a therapist, be diagnosed with depression, take prescription medication. They are more likely to go to doctors for routine screenings, but less likely to go to the emergency room. Right? So when men share housework and childcare, oh, and they report much higher levels of marital satisfaction. So when men share housework and childcare, the men are happier and healthier. All right, maybe that's not enough of a motivation for men. <laughs> so here's the fourth finding. When men share housework and childcare, they have more sex. <laughs> now of these four findings, which one do you think Men's Health Magazine put on its cover? <laughs> <laughs> Housework makes her horny. <laughs> no, not when she does it. Right? So it, so, um, now wait, let, let me just, I want to caution the men in this room. 
this finding is an aggregate finding over a very long time. So those of you who are thinking, I'm going to go home tonight and do those dishes, <laughs> this is not a one-time thing. <laughs> this is over a long period of time. <laughs> but this is the kind of argument, I think, that we need to be making, that it is in our interest that everybody benefits when men are, are, are more egalitarian in their homes. Now, I want to turn to one more area, and that's the sex. And I want to talk about two issues that, that we don't talk about much in the same breath at, on, on college campuses. Um, but I think they affect us all on college campuses, and I want to talk about them just uh, together for a few minutes. And they are date and acquaintance rates on the one hand, and uh, HIV on the other. Uh, and you've all gotten some, uh, some good training and some, uh, some brochures and stuff during first year orientation at least about HIV risk reduction and about, um, and about sexual assault awareness. So I want to talk about them as what's similar. Let me take HIV first. Now, um, what's your best way to, re to reduce your risk of HIV transmission? Bonds. American, Don't have sex. what was that? Don't have sex. Don't have sex. <laughs> Abstinence, right. And it, it's a very effective way to reduce your risk, <laughs> except, if, you know, except if you're an IV drug user. But, um, but here's the thing about abstinence. I have nothing wrong, I have no problem with abstinence as a personal lifestyle choice. You could decide for psychological reasons, religious reasons, emotional reasons, political reasons, not to have sex until you get married. But don't you think we ought to agree about what abstinence means? We, the problem with abstinence-based sex education is that we don't really know what it entails because you can't talk about it. For example, do you know that of high, that 40% of high school abstinence pledgers believe that oral sex does not violate their abstinence pledge? Do you know that 10% of high school abstinence pledgers believe that anal sex doesn't violate their abstinence pledge? Did you know that 10% of high school abstinence pledgers believe that kissing with tongues does violate their abstinence pledge? Now, statistically, I do not think that's the same 10%. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there are lots of people going, you can do that, but don't kiss me. <laughs> so, so, we, so and the thing about, I, I, so as I say, I'm nothing against it as a personal lifestyle choice, but as public policy for college age students, it's exactly wrong. And it has nothing to do with a sort of ideological feminist blue state agenda. It has to do with simple demography. It has to do with the onset of fertility, age of first intercourse, and age of marriage. The easiest way to say this is if you are a traditionally aged college student here at Occidental, you will never again for the rest of your life be around so many people who are both sexually active and unmarried. This is the place where those two things intersect. I always worry when I say this, if there's somebody out there going, oh my god, I'm a junior, I better get busy. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is, most people do most of their sexual experimentation during their college age years. So, so this is the, this is, I mean, don't you remember when your parents sent you off to Occidental and they said, these are going to be the best years of your life. What do you think that, what do you think you <laughs> meant? <laughs> ah, we know. So obviously you need another discourse, and that other discourse is not, is not absence, but safe sex or safer sex. And here's the problem with the phrase itself, with, safe, with the phrase safe sex itself. Remember that the fourth rule of manhood, give them hell, always go for it. To men, the phrase safe sex itself is an oxymoron, right? You know what an oxymoron is, like, like you know, military intelligence, business ethics, or my personal favorite oxymoron, social science. Um, 